Sup, Chooms? So we're getting pretty close to the 4th of July, in case you guys haven't noticed, and that means many Americans are going to be cracking open the beer and popping some champagne corks in order to raise a toast to our glorious nation's independence from the British Empire, as well as our own declaration of independence from the Slaphead Curse. With all the fear-mongering and misinformation out there about fighting hair loss from the Jeshavit Bro community, as well as the finasteride hate cults online, finding the courage to fight to preserve our aesthetic identity is something I think is worthy of celebration regardless of what nation you are from or what beverages you choose to drink, whether it be beer or lemonade. Let us unite as citizens of the world to fight for our, air, our hair and fight back against those who try to shame us for not being afraid to admit that the bald and bearded look is simply not for us and we are not ashamed to fight for our hair. Now, it is common knowledge in the scientific and medical community that hair loss is caused by the presence of the trash hormone DHT dihydrotestosterone on the scalp of individuals who are genetically sensitive to androgenic alopecia. That is why finasteride works so well, obviously, since all we have to do is just take a pill and it lowers DHT on the scalp. Simple, right? Well, certainly it is true that finasteride, even when used by itself, will stop hair loss in 90% of people and even regrow hair in about 66% of people. No doubt about it, DHT is the enemy number one when it comes to hair loss. But is it possible that certain environmental factors, like those 4th of July celebratory beverages, for instance, could be making our fight against the Norwood Reaper even more difficult. So, when it comes to certain vices like cigarette smoking, I have examined the evidence to answer the question as to whether or not tobacco use can make hair loss worse, and the research I did at the time seemed to suggest that it did. I'm going to go ahead and link that video below if you want to learn more about that, but naturally, being that we're approaching a holiday where many people drink in celebration, it made me curious about whether or not drinking alcohol can also contribute to hair loss for whatever reasons. So this video should be considered a direct follow-up to my video on smoking and hair loss, so make sure you watch that video first before watching this one. So we know that hair loss is caused by androgenic alopecia and that androgenic alopecia is a genetic trait. People who have androgenic alopecia can be the absolute pinnacle of good health and abstain from all drugs and alcohol and still be completely bald. Conversely, you can have someone who is a slovenly degenerate loser who still has a full head of hair, which is a strong reminder of just how damn unfair life and hair loss can be. This is important to remember because online hairline fraud cells will often try to overemphasize factors behind hair loss that turn out to be extremely minor or completely benign, such as trying to market uh, biotin as a hair loss supplement, for instance, even though biotin deficiencies are very rare outside of the developing world, or they'll promote fringe hair loss theories such as the Brit flu theory. So environmental factors, even if they do play any role at all, will never be as strong of a causation for hair loss as genetics. But despite all that, let's examine alcohol to see if it has any role in hair loss. There unfortunately aren't any studies that look only at alcohol and androgenic alopecia, but there are several studies that look at alcohol as one of several risk factors for the progression of hair loss or increased severity of hair loss in individuals with androgenic alopecia. So the first study is from 2003 and is entitled, quote, Androgenic alopecia in men aged 40 to 69 years, prevalence and risk factors, unquote. So this study, despite having fairly limited age ranges, nevertheless had a very large sample size. It looked at 1,390 men from Australia who were actually recruited for a different study on prostate cancer. The men were assessed for androgenic alopecia and classified as either having no androgenic alopecia, frontal androgenic alopecia, vertex androgenic alopecia, or full androgenic alopecia. So, I don't know why they didn't just go ahead and use the Norwood scale like in most studies, but at least we have some metric in place in which to distinguish the subjects based on their hair loss severity. So the researchers looked at various risk factors to see if there's any association with androgenic alopecia, including factors like the age of puberty, presence of acne, smoking history, and interestingly enough, marital status. And it was funny to see that the researchers considered marriage to be a risk factor for hair loss. That might warrant a video by itself one day, we'll see. But they did find that consumption of alcohol was associated with an increased risk of frontal and vertex androgenic alopecia, but not full androgenic alopecia. They had hypothesized that since alcohol use raises serum estradiol levels that alcohol might actually reduce androgenic alopecia. But to quote the study, quote, 
We observed in contrast that drinking alcoholic beverages more than once a month on average was associated with a significantly increased risk of about 50 to 60% for frontal and vertex androgenic alopecia, but not for full androgenic alopecia, but there was little evidence of a dose response with increasing alcohol consumption, unquote. They concluded from this finding that it would be worth attempting to replicate the finding in other studies. On a side note, though, they addressed the, quote, commonly held opinion that men with androgenic alopecia are more masculine than men who do not have androgenic alopecia, unquote. Interestingly, when looking at these men's sexual activity, they found, quote, little evidence to support the view that men with androgenic alopecia were more sexually active than men with more hair. We found, to the contrary, a tendency in the opposite direction. Men with androgenic alopecia having somewhat fewer partners than men without androgenic alopecia, unquote. This is no surprise and is in fact corroborated by plenty of data. In fact, there was a recent survey, which I'll link below, that involved 2,000 women aged 25 to 40 where only 13% said they found bald men attractive and one out of five said they would not date a bald man under any circumstances and would dump their per current partner if he were to go bald. Furthermore, a whopping Two-thirds of all women agreed that men lose attractiveness when they lose their hair, and one out of three women said that hair is the biggest source of attraction when looking at a new potential partner. So more important than height, more important than muscle pass, more mass, more important than anything, hair is that important. Welcome to the show, sir. Take okay. it away and give it your best shots. Hello, lady. My name is Emmett, and I'm from Roscommon. <laughs> a bit old and he's baldy like me dad. It's just the hair, the lack of, I mean, I'm sorry. So it might be possible for bald men to compensate a little bit, but it's without question that going bald will completely shut the doors for men with many, not all, but many women completely. And even though this study doesn't state this, I imagine many women's rejection of bald men isn't purely just an aesthetic thing. I see a lot of hot women with average looking boyfriends or husbands all the time, in fact. Being bald, it doesn't just give a poor cosmetic impression, it also gives the impression of apathy and indifference. When women see fit athletic men, for instance, they don't just like it because they look good, but they also appreciate the level of dedication a man puts into maintaining a healthy, physically attractive physique likely because their dedication to hard work makes them seem like more dependable partners who would also put a lot more effort into their relationship. And the same thing applies to men who go the extra mile to maintain their hair. When a guy who is losing his hair just gives up and lets himself look like a goddamn cancer patient, it really says something about that guy. So sure, bald men will say that accepting baldness is being confident, but the thing about confidence is that it has to be earned. Otherwise, it's just delusional. We wouldn't, for instance, call it confidence if Eugenia Cooney said she could defeat Mike Tyson in a boxing match, and we shouldn't call it confidence when a bald man says his hair loss will not have any effect on his chances with women. That's not confidence. That's just blue pill delusion. I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm just trying to be realistic. Any confidence a man has being bald is about as useless as a knitted condom or fake tits on a zombie. So getting back to the study, this was the first research to suggest that there might be an association between alcohol and androgenic alopecia. Though it doesn't look like this is a strong association, but maybe there is something here, given that this is a rather large study of nearly 1,400 men. So next, let's go ahead and look at another study from Good Korea from 2013 with an even larger number of study subjects entitled, quote, An Epidemiological Study of Androgenic Alopecia in 3,114 Korean Patients, unquote. So all these patients had androgenic alopecia and two-thirds of them were men. As expected, the biggest pr predictor of hair loss was family history of hair loss, which was present in 64% of men and 50% of women with androgenic alopecia. So, regarding smoking and drinking, this graph shows the correlation between men and women with and without these habits and the severity of hair loss. It's a little difficult to figure this graph out, but the bottom line is that in women, there was no correlation between smoking and drinking and severity of hair loss. But in men, the combination of smoking plus drinking 
drinking tended, re tended to result in more severe degrees of hair loss. So again, like in the first study, alcohol seems to cause some worsening of androgenic alopecia, though it certainly is not the biggest factor, which of course is family history. The next study is from India and was published in 2017. Its title is, quote, Early Onset Androgenetic Alopecia in Men and Associated Risk Factors, a Hospital-Based Study, unquote. It looked at 103 men who were seen in a dermatology clinic in the hospital for androgenic alopecia. They looked at smoking and alcohol consumption, though they are vague on what they considered alcohol consumption. I mean, is it one drink a month? Is it weekend binge drinking or daily alcohol use? Who knows? It's tough to know. Anyways, they found no significant association with smoking and age of onset of androgenic alopecia, but they did find a statistically significant association between alcohol consumption and the age of onset of androgenic alopecia as seen in this figure. Though, as you can see, we are just talking about 15 patients who drank alcohol here. I mean, maybe that's normal in, in India, but it seems like a rather low percentage of 103 patients. Remember, people often will lie or at least minimize their alcohol use on questionnaires since alcohol use is still considered taboo in many parts of the world. So it's hard to take this result very seriously. Finally, we're at the most recent study from 2020 entitled, quote, Androgenetic Alopecia, Relationship to Anthropometric Indices, Blood Pressure, and Lifestyle Habits, unquote. This is from Iran, which is interesting since I'm pretty sure that alcohol consumption is illegal in Iran, although I could be wrong or maybe there is an exception when it comes to scientific research like we see here. Anyways, they looked at 256 men with androgenic alopecia and matched them to 256 men without androgenic alopecia who served as controls for the study. They they looked at a number of lifestyle-related factors, including weight and height, BMI, waist and hip circumferences, blood pressure, and of course, smoking and alcohol use. Once again, the biggest risk factor for androgenic alopecia in this study was family history. Only 35% of men with androgenic alopecia had a negative family history of androgenic alopecia, while 76% of men without androgenic alopecia had a negative family history of androgenic alopecia, so no surprise. Again, that is clearly a indicator that genetics, not lifestyle and environmental factors, play the biggest role in developing androgenic alopecia. The BMI for the patients was slightly lower in androgenic alopecia uh, patients than in controls, and the ratio for waist to hip circumferences was lower in androgenic alopecia patients, which seems to indicate that being slender might be a risk factor for androgenic alopecia, which may seem weird, but then uh, you have to remember, and of course this is speculation, that this could also be because of the fact that more adipose tissue in humans is associated with higher estrogen levels, your fat is an endocrine secreting tissue after all. The researcher also the research also showed that blood pressure had no influence on the development of androgenic alopecia, which must be a crushing disappointment to the blood flow and scalp massage crowd. The researchers found that there was no significant difference between the percentage of smokers in the androgenic alopecia and non-androgenic alopecia groups. 28% of the androgenic alopecia group were smokers and 26% of the control group were smokers, which was too small of a difference to be significant. Also, there was no difference in alcohol consumption. 10% of the androgenic alopecia group consumed alcohol, while 8% of the control group consumed alcohol, which again is statistically insignificant. In this study, they defined alcohol users as anyone who had consumed any alcohol within 30 days of enrollment in the study, which is a problem because by this definition, they might end up lumping together casual drinkers and hardcore alcoholics. So it's difficult to make a whole lot from this. I mean, there are people who only drink once or twice per year who may just happen to have had a drink in the past 30 days because of a celebration or something, yet if you are someone who only has a couple drinks per year, then you're basically a non-drinker. So I think uh, maybe a more precise definition of drinker could have been used here. Uh, however, one thing I thought that was interesting is that it turns out hookah users had more mild androgenic alopecia than non-hookah users, as seen in this table here. So I guess you can break out your hookahs, guys. Although keep in mind, hookah, what a hookah is, is just a smoke tool so it's post so it's possible that hookah users weren't all smoking tobacco and being that this was in Iran which is a very culturally conservative nation I doubt it was anything stronger than tobacco either now I know hookah bars will sometimes just use flavored vape juice so it's possible some of these hookah users uh, were just using a benign substance like this so who knows but anyways in the discussion the authors point out and I'll go ahead and point this out too that based on the literature review in this video that various studies have given very inconsistent results regarding the 
effects of smoking, alcohol, as well as other lifestyle factors like BMI and obesity on the incidence, severity, and age of onset of androgenic alopecia. So the bottom line from my point of view is that if there is any association between lifestyle and androgenic alopecia, it is a weak one. Nevertheless, in other studies that look at smoking and andro androgenic alopecia in more detail that I covered in my video link below, there was a more clear association between smoking and androgenic alopecia since smoking has an anti-estrogenic effect and estrogen is in fact good for the hair. And I have a video where I discuss estrogen's role in promoting hair growth, which I'll go ahead and link below. But even if the correlation of androgenic alopecia with alcohol and other environmental factors is weak, clearly both smoking and alcohol as well as obesity have other very bad health effects, so it is probably best to eliminate them from your lifestyle as much as possible regardless of their effects on hair growth. So in conclusion, this 4th of July, if you want to raise a toast to a certain 5A reductase inhibitor, feel free to do so. After all, it is a holiday and there is a time to, in place to celebrate these type of things. However, make sure you go easy on the boost because the last thing you want when you're surrounded by a bunch of attractive randy lasses at a party is to get whiskey dick. So don't be a gonk and have a preem holiday. Take care.